Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode. So today's episode is our second episode in our deal analysis where we talk about some syndication deals around here in Denver. So in the previous one, we talked about a 25 unit portfolio in Wheat Ridge, uh, Colorado, uh, that my guest day took down. We got great feedback on that. So definitely keep these uh, podcasts coming. So my two guests are Terrence Doyle. He's the founder of the Verico. Terrence, glad to have you back. Chris, thanks for having us. And our other guest is Ben Davis, who's the CFO at Virco. How's it going, Ben? Great. Glad to be here. Yeah. So, I mean, let's just jump into this. Like, what what property or what portfolio are we talking about today? Yeah. So, we just call it High Ogden. It's on High Street, which is in Park Hill. And then Ogden is either North Rhino, Berkeley, whatever you want to call these different pockets of neighborhoods in Denver. Everyone seems to have a different term. But it's a HUD deal. Yeah, sorry. Real, yeah. Uh, but for we got a lot of national listeners in our last podcast. How would you describe those neighborhoods? Like, what type of neighborhoods are those? Because Denver listeners know, but like right. for the outside, these, yeah. these are great neighborhoods. Yeah, we've actually got a lot of feedback from people from around the country, so we should clarify the neighborhoods. So, City Park, Park Hill, they're just areas that used to be, I think, lower middle class, and they've just really had a lot of influx of money and development come into them the last four or five years and just restaurants, new developments, brand new class A buildings, brand new retail, uh, brand new homes, million dollar homes. So it's just an up and coming, just an area that's been developed. Yeah. And these are 11 connected row homes and they're roughly 800 square feet side by side with, and it sits on two and a half acres, basically in a really great part of Denver. So the land is, is really valuable. Land? Yeah. Wow. that much land. So what makes it interesting is that they're currently used as apartments, but because Denver has this special, you know, zoning kind of carve out where you can party wall, party wall just means on a survey, we say, this is what this person owns with this address. And they're already broken up by address. So right now it's HUD. And so it's a HAP contract, which is housing assistance program. And so the, gov the federal government pays the rents right now, guarantees them. It's 100% paid? 95 to 100%, depending okay. on the individual. So they qualify based on their income, and then the government comes in and says, we're going to subsidize, and, and based on their age and a bunch of different variables. So it was difficult because, you know, so we've actually been, so the backstory is, you know, I saw this deal last August, and the broker called me and said, hey, I have a deal that I think would fit you really well. I know that you've done a lot of flips and you own apartments. This I think could fit really well. Um, and he called me on a Friday. I said, hey, Matt, give me the weekend to underwrite it and let's talk again on Monday. And basically I never heard from him again. So I called him like a week later. I said, hey, Matt, I really like that deal. What's going on? He goes, oh yeah, sorry, man. I put it, we put it under contract last week. So this has never happened to me before. So, you know, I learned a valuable lesson there is, you know, when someone calls you with a deal, the question I should have asked is how much time do I have to review this? Or are you putting this out to other people? I just assumed based on kind of my experience in the network and the brokers that I've worked with that when they call me for a deal, they normally give me the first, they f kind of give me a couple days to look at so it. So you think like 72 hours? Yeah. Normally like I just like, I would, it's kind of unspoken, like, Hey, look at it. And if you don't like it, we're going to send it to someone else, but we're bringing it to you. You have a shot at it. And that didn't happen. So it was really good experience for me. And I think moving forward, you know, since this time, I've been much more intentional about asking that question of, hey, how much time do I have to look at this before you send it to other people or what's the situation? I just assumed that I had, you know, a couple of days to look at it. And uh, so anyway, so it went under contract with someone else and we lost the deal. And so this was August 2019. This so is last year, year last okay. August, yeah, over a year ago. Yeah, <clears throat> maybe just a year ago. And then the year turns and I, for whatever reason in February, I had it in my notes to like call Matt to just check on, and he's just a broker in town, really experienced apartment broker. And I had it in my notes to call him and follow up. So I called him to follow up and I said, Hey Matt, let's schedule a coffee. So we, we get coffee and he proceeds to tell me that the deal just fell out of contract and uh, that the, the gentleman that put it under contract was going to develop the land because it's zoned for 11 single family homes. Okay. And in that neighborhood, those single family homes would probably be worth around a million bucks. So he proceeds to tell me it felt a contract. HUD had the first right of refusal. And when they found out that he was a developer that was going to tear it down, they, they exercised their right. So they killed the deal. Oh, okay. Right? So 
I was like, phenomenal. I love the deal. We have basically no deals in the pipeline right now. You know, it was February, we turned the year. We, you know, I think we were looking for our next larger, larger play. So the timing worked out well. And I had already underwritten the deal six or seven months ago. And it was in, you know, so to your point, it was in really high dense, high areas of growth neighborhoods in Denver, where there's a lot of development. Prices are rapidly rising. Rents are greatly appreciating. And the deal just made a ton of sense for our model. And so to clarify here, because these are, these are two separate parcels, right? That's right. So yeah. what's the, what's the, what are the two parcels like? What are the structures on there? So the high street one is 11 connected row homes, okay. or apartments that are roughly 800 square feet each that have a front and a very large backyard. And those are all connected. And then Ogden is just your typical six unit, uh, three units up, three units down, two bedroom, one bath. Okay, and so those are standard roughly multi-family standard there. multifamily right there in that Berkeley, North Rhino area. Okay. Yep. But, but the high street's the one that sits on a, a lot of a lot, a of, lot land. of land. Yep. Okay. And those already have existing party wall agreements? They don't. Okay. We'll have to do that. So that's they something that you, okay. We will Great. do. That was part of our due diligence. Yeah. Yep. And yep. so uh, talking about the underwriting of this, so yep. like did, any, did underwriting change from a year ago versus six months ago? Like did anything change the property? Anything change the way you underwrote it? Because six months ago, this was really before COVID became a thing, right? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. It, it did change because a year ago, we weren't syndicating and we would have just closed with our own capital. And so a year ago, I think we were much more aggressive with the l- kind of leverage we would get, the amount so you, of you interest. You would have gotten we, higher leverage. We would have gotten higher on. leverage. We probably would have, would have paid more, you know, uh, we probably would have paid more monthly interest. Um, yeah, we would have underwritten it much differently because it had been our own capital. So we could have been much more aggressive and we definitely wouldn't have done a phase one. Um, we would have looked at the property much differently and it worked for our own capital a year ago and it looked, and it looked tremendous. And then this year with Ben, obviously we're doing, you know, on these larger deals that are over two, 3 million, we're syndicating them. And so the underwriting looked a lot different. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when we first uh, brought these to the lenders back in, it was March, you know, it was like week two of the virus. And we said, look, these rents are guaranteed. You, we know you're not really interested in new loans right now, but you'll be interested in this one. The federal government's gonna gonna pay. So, you know, vacancy's not even not even a thing. And they were still they were still it was like shaking no, their head at it. Yeah, it was. No one knew what was gonna happen. It was the peak of of you know the last week of March, first week of April. And so, well, for like those six weeks where yeah, the, the, the really, lending really just oh, the world shut down. Yeah, yeah, shut down. Yeah. Okay, so you guys hit it. Yeah. So worst time comparatively was, to what was done last year in 2019 when we looked at it, a lot had changed. Okay. We we're very conservative on even the rents that we were going to be doing, because what so what's interesting about this property is so there's a HAP contract that lasts and it's from the federal government and it's guaranteed for 20 years. So what happens is these these operators that own these HUD properties around the country the value of them actually increases the closer it gets to that contract expiring yep. because then they can bring it back to market rents. So this particular operator has been trying to sell this for the last year, year and a half, apparently, because they were going to trade into some larger properties. And yeah, so come February, March, you know, he had already been under contract, has been wanting to sell. But what worked out in our favor was this contract, the property is increasingly increasing in value every month. And due to, due to the virus, you know, banks are taking longer than ever to underwrite the HUD process. I mean, how many people went on vacation from HUD, you know, during this process that they, because you have to get approved. So the federal government has to do a, a full underwriting of who you are as an operator, your company, you know, because basically they're going to be sending you federal money. And so they need to make sure that before that, you don't have any fraud, you don't have any bankruptcy. And they do a full, and it's been really, they're been doing f- that much of a five uh, months. Oh, it's very in depth. You have to have dealt with properties of this size, done construction of meets what you're going to do on this. They want to see a full, they want to see who is on your staff. They want to see your payroll. They want to see what your plans are for the property. They want to know that you have the reserves to handle the maintenance. I mean, every, they want to see a full business plan. It's, it's in depth. I mean, it I don't know like how many hours. college or, you know, to get in the military. It's like, did you have to write a comprehensive like a personal essay? No, we did. We wrote some. Really? Oh letters. yeah. About oh, yeah. my background and our company and what we're about and how we, yeah, absolutely. Cultural yeah. sensitivity. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's a comprehensive Look, everyone's approved from HUD, from the property manager to the tenant to the owner. Everyone involved with the property has been 
you know, underwritten by HUD. So what's good is there's a high barrier to entry. So not just anyone can be approved. Yeah. And so it made being able to buy this property, you know, it, I think it allowed us to be, it, to separate ourselves from the pack that the broker and the current owner felt good that we would get approved and that, you know, moving forward, we'll be able to do more projects like this Cause and then not the, everyone could get approved. What was the total purchase price for this that you guys are taking it down for, if you can share? Yeah, 2.85. Okay, so I mean, it, it's a good size, but that's kind of in that transition from a lot of like, you know, the smaller operators to that's bigger right. ones where you probably don't know like the, the big players coming down to the size, right? Right. So that's oh, why yeah. you're advantage. Exactly. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so the underwriting changed a lot to your question, and we we're much more conservative on back end values, on rents, and on how, you know, the world, you know, financing and, and everything. And it's taken. We still, we're scheduled to close, I think, in the next two weeks just because the HUD up. We got one of the first, and Ben can talk about this more, but we actually had to get a, a separate attorney just to represent us that is a, a HUD approved attorney. And hmm. I think they're five or 600 an hour. I mean, her bill's large. She's been great. I mean, they're great, but it's expensive. Very special. Every time huh? she calls, yeah, I'm like, how quickly can I get out the phone? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I got to go. Bye. So before we actually go into all the, all the underwriting there, I want to kind of take a, a bigger step back, like what's the big level, the, the big picture game plan? And you got two different properties. That's right. It sounds like two different exit strategies. Yeah. Um, what What's the, the big picture game plan before we jump in the numbers? So we have, so what I like about this is we have options. If, you know, currently right now, the HUD contract runs through February of 2022. So the rents are guaranteed for roughly the next year and a half. And that's both properties. Both properties, 17 units. And so, you know, with debt being pretty cheap right now, we're able to still cash flow, you know, amidst a lot of uncertainty. I think most people you talk to right now, regardless of your political stance or view or anything, what's going to happen in November, they're going to say, hey, I think things are a little shaky. And so what's nice is we can kind of watch and see how the economy comes out of the virus, you know, coming out of the election. And if things appear really unshaky, we can exercise a 20 year option and we can hold this thing for 20 years. And basically the federal government would pay down the majority of the principal and the debt for the next 20 years. So that's like that's option there's there that's one option. The second option would be is we can party wall we can party wall the high street property which basically just means every single apartment becomes its own residence which is done all over Denver. It's a really common strategy right now because it's hot, yeah. A, a lot of people can make a big profit margin taking a fourplex and making four condos or whatever it is. That's a, a lot yeah, yeah. a lot of people are doing that it's now. It's done a lot especially in these kind yeah. of neighborhoods. So what makes this property unique is when we compared it to other apartments that have been party walled is that, you know, the size of the unit, it's 800 square feet, has its own washer and dryer. We can actually put a garage behind it and it still has a yard. Most of these properties that have been party walled did not come with a lot of land. Oh yeah. And so that's what makes this really, really valuable. They have a concrete alley. That's exactly right. They have basically almost no yard and then just your structure. And and to still be in this neighborhood, you know, when you're surrounded by homes that are five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars or more. And you can be into this neighborhood for under four hundred thousand, have a brand new place with a yard. You know, it becomes that's that's where it becomes really attractive for you know a first time home buyer. So we can separate them, and the back end value is somewhere between three thirty and three fifty. Okay. And so we could we could we could party wall it and sell them as individual residences in the year two thousand twenty two when the contract expires. And that's one strategy for the high for the high street property. And then Ogden, we would most likely, when the contract expires, r- do our typical renovation because that area is really growing. There's a great tenant base there of young professionals, singles, young couples, you know, without children that you know we can really serve that we've done at our other projects, and you know we have a lot of familiar fam- familiarity with. And, and what's the layout at the six unit like? Like two the, bed, one bath. Okay. All what's two this? bed, one bath. They're like seven hundred and seven hundred and fifty square feet, maybe. And yeah. you get washer dryer and they don't currently. We okay. we could definitely add that. There's space for that. Okay, so it'll be a really good setup then. Yeah. Sure it'll be a really good setup. The okay. neighborhood's great, a lot of walkability. Uh, we spend a lot of time, you know, doing you know, our market research we can we can talk about later during due diligence. But yeah, that'll just be a typical apartment that we hold, most likely long term. Okay. Yeah. Cause we because basically when we sell if we sell the 11 condos on High Street for an average of $340,000, we've basically just paid down the note 100% and returned all the money back to the investors. And then we could just cash flow high, you know, Ogden Street for in perpetuity and we don't it free and clear. Because you said this was a total about, uh, you said 285? That's right. Okay, so what was this, what's the rough, uh, how much of that is to Ogden, how much is to High Street? Well, it's not. 
it's not underwritten in that way. Okay. Just 160,000 a unit, basically. Okay, so it's kind of separate after. We, did, we okay. didn't separate right. it, yeah. And that kind of plays into the the strategy is that the principal pay down that you can achieve from selling the individual condos on high will cause you to essentially own Ogden outright. Okay. Then you would refinance, obviously. But um, so you, if the as the model goes through, you basically own Ogden outright because of the sale of high. Okay. But there's not one loan, you know, debt value assigned to each property. Okay. You guys don't even do that for an your internal. No, we just did it one sixty okay. across well, the board. No, you'd have to appraise, yeah. and you know, you would just. I guess you could take the two appraisals and divide by the total. And figure out how you know proportionately how much okay. debt went to each one, but part of the negotiation with the seller was I'm selling Ogden with high. Yeah, you know we would we would have, I guess looked at buying high. Yeah, separately, but that's he's smart enough to know. Sells a package exactly. Deal. Yeah. 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 All right, so let's start getting into the weeds here. Yeah. So um, after you lost out. That's right. Which I'm surprised because you're usually like Mr. Speedy. Right. Um, but you got it back under contract. February of February. Yeah, it was like mid. I think we met the first or second week of February, and I think we were under contract the next week. Okay. Once he told me it had fallen out, and you know, I was just really clear because this is the first deal I've done with this broker. He's really well known. He's got a big buyer's list, and him and I have been talking for probably two or three years. Just a typical example of patience, right? I mean, I've, this is a guy I've been talking to for a long time. He's got great deals just because he's a lot of the people that own apartments in Denver, legacy owners he sold them to them. So he's got a great list of, of clients. And so it's someone I definitely wanted to build a relationship with. And so this is the first two we've done. So I just didn't have that rapport with him like I do with some other guys that are closer to my age that I've done a lot more volume with. Yeah. And so it was really good learning experience for me. So, you know, I just told him when we sat down, I said, hey, just so you know, I didn't realize that I was on a shot call. I didn't know, you know, kind of what the situation, but I really liked that deal. And then that's when he proceeded to say, well, actually it just fell out. I'd love to work on it with you. I know you're a great buyer. I think I can get you approved. This is what happened with the previous buyer. Let's work on it. And we were under contract within seven days. Okay. So walk me. So uh, you were under contract at 285. Was That's that right. The, okay. 285. And then what was your due diligence inspection li- like? And then we'll talk underwriting. So the big concern for this seller was, can these guys get HUD approval? So what I, so what we did was we uh, called a couple friends that lived on the East Coast that had relationships in DC. And I said, how do I go about getting approved from HUD? Because I need to show a letter basically stating that I have a really good chance of getting approved. Because yeah, at this point, you're, you had no clue for the process. Right? No or, clue. Okay. I was Uncharted you know, waters for I, you guys? Yeah, uncharted. And okay. I just was like, we'll figure it out. We yeah. can get, get this done. And so I made a few phone calls and I was referred to a couple different HUD owners. And they said, this is the number one HUD attorney in the country. They're really expensive, but she will be able to tell you whether or not you're going to get approved. So schedule a call with her. So I was on the phone with her the next day. I go through the story and she's like, I can, you you know, tell me your background. And we went through the, everything and she goes, yeah, I can get you approved. I can write you a letter. So she wrote a letter of recommendation, basically saying based on Terrence and the Veracos background, their experience and blah, blah, blah. I can, you know, we think that there's, you know, and whatever legalese that they use to protect themselves, she basically said, we can get them approved. So we submitted that along with our offer and we were able to go under contract, but that was Part of the so that's the, part of your offer for our contract. Absolutely, because okay. their biggest concern was getting through the HUD approval because the HUD has the first right of refusal. Okay. They had already been through a five month yeah. process with another buyer. Yeah, you know, so their their top priority was you know who can close, bring someone yeah. that, that can do this, can get approved. So yeah. with that, I mean, were you doing your own like inspection due diligence yeah. while you're waiting for the HUD process, or I mean, the HUD process sounded like that was the the first that was big really domino. big hurdle. Yeah. So once we got the letter from the attorney basically saying, we can get them approved. We're going to work with them. And actually the seller knew this attorney. So she knew, you know, so I think that helped us a lot. The fact that they recognized, okay, if they're working with the, this, this attorney, they're going to have a, a better chance than not to get approved. So then from there, we did our typical due diligence, right? So we did our phase one, did this, you know, the soils test. And then we went in, hired our inspector that does our, does the apartments and did a full inspection. And mind you, this was like in March and April after COVID. So it was very touch and go as far as getting into all the units, being able to see all the mechanicals, but we were able to do that. And actually we used the report from the previous buyer as well. So we did our own that wasn't as, because I, I do think that HUD didn't allow us in all the units. So we didn't actually, in some of the 
Was that HUD rules or, or COVID rules? No, the property manager was protecting some of the tenants that were high risk. And so we weren't able to get okay. into all the units. And so what we did, the broker, he was able to call the previous buyer that was under contract and we got their inspection. So we oh, combined good. their inspection with our inspection with the, you know, cause we were able to do the outside, the roof, the sewer and a couple units, but not all of them. And some of the units actually had furnaces in them. The, the high Ogden one, okay. the furnaces are in the units. So it got, so that was also some different hurdles that came up, but we were able to combine the inspection reports and, and then we were able to get $110,000, $20,000 off based on uh, the roof. One of the roofs, actually the high Ogden roof was new, but the Ogden roof needed some work. So we got that. There's some sewer work. Um, all the, the entire mechanical system, I think was bad. There was some electrical there. You know, the property has been a HUD property. It hasn't been touched in basically 20 years. Yeah, I want to ask you about this because, you know, one of my, my first experiences, I, I did a short stint uh, with some multifamily brokerage in, in California and like right. some rent control areas. Yeah. And and part of my territory was, uh, you know, normal market rent. And then there was, uh, I forget what street it was, like, uh, you know, a main boulevard in uh, unincorporated LA County. And there right. was always rent control. Right. And it was night and day different. It was really like the other side of the tracks. So like, hey, the market side rents, they or the market side, the Market rent side of the street was up to date, uh, very nice. You go to the other side, it was a dump. I felt right. like I was uh, in like a, you know, kind of like a random town in Mexico. <laughs> right. It was just like, I mean, it was just, it was trashy. Like it was very poor quality living for the tenants. Yeah. And I, I learned through there was just, it, you know, it was very bad because, you know, the, unfortunately, again, I don't know how it works with HUD, but out there like uh, in LA, once you are in that market or that, the uh, rent control area, you can only raise rents like 2% a year, right. or 3% a year. So if you've had a tenant there for 20 years, and you know, LA has gone through amazing rent increases right. last 20 years, cost of living increases, they're bringing up 3%. So they got you know people that are $1,000 per market rent. They don't have the money or the incentives to upgrade it. Right. And the tenants want to move out because they move out, they move out to a place with market rent. So it's just bad catch 22 and the properties were just crappy. So I'm curious to like, you know, multis in Denver a lot of times are, are not the best of shape. But like, was this like your standard multi or was this like under, like like worse than usual because it was a HUD property and the owner just like, hey, I'm getting the rinse no matter what, so I'm not touching it. Yeah. So actually HUD does their own inspection. and Like annually? I believe annually. Okay. Annually at most every two years. And if tenants complain, I mean, the owner can get in a big trouble. Oh, wow. Oh, okay. it's very tenant friendly. I mean, it's designed to really protect tenants and they're not unfair to landlords, but they're so... Well, now, when I hear, say, LA, yeah. the, the so there wasn't like yeah. mold, you know, they're not like letting the tenants live in kind of the conditions you're talking about. I mean, the tenants are definitely protected from, you know, anything like that. But I would just say like, you know, windows, some of the windows were cracked. Some of the flooring may be uneven. The electrical was just outdated. Uh, there was a couple sewer issues. So just things like that. Just a normal property was built in the 60s in Denver in that neighborhood that just hadn't been, you know, the CapEx hadn't been done. But as far okay. as like safety like tenant safety and livability and cleanliness. I mean, it wasn't anything abnormal. Like, you know, we've seen a bunch of projects. It wasn't anything worse than like Wyandotte or Jersey. Okay, I mean, so it was, it was par for the course. Yeah, it was Denver. actually better. I mean, it didn't have like the same amount of like, I would say pest control issues. One and, way they yeah. do it is, to give you an example, HUD did their own inspection. And unlike a regular inspection where they're kind of looking at what's happened to the house and the life of the roof and, you know, everything in the house, it, it gives them a projection forward to HUD, from the inspector to HUD. It's called a PCNA. And basically, HUD came back to us and said, okay, the inspector thought, you know, the MEP, the roof, the floors, the sewers have X amount of years left before they need to be replaced. And therefore, you need to have a reserve account. We need to know that you have the cash in the account in these years hmm. to do these projects basically saying you have to do them yeah so you can as a hut owner no you know the roofs got is leaking and you just don't care you know you say oh the you know the federal government's paying the rent forget it they know they kind of make you a uh renovation timeline and you have to show that you can have the cash on hand to perform those improvements Luckily for us on this deal, we we're planning renovations in 2022, so our budget exceeded the minimum budget. So that was not a, you know, not a deal breaker for us. But if they, they, 
with that method, they're able to eliminate a buyer that whose plan is just to you know acquire the property and let it set for ten years and you know so depreciate with that uh, required reserves. Are they making you put in like a, a special trust account or like a separate bank account? They call just, a, hey, we got this cash from the bank. Or do we have to like separate it out so they know it's earmarked. They call for... it a property uh, operating account, which has to be, which is the same account that the rents will be deposited into. So they've kind of got you there. Okay. Like you have to tell us what account to put your your rent income in, and the minimum balance for years twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, and twenty five have to be X. So that we know you have enough cash to replace that sewer, mm, okay. When we think the sewer is going to fall apart, which is maybe next year. Yeah, you're not getting over on the U.S. government. I mean, they're no, checking it's all their boxes. Tight. I mean, I think they've had a lot of fraud attempts, in the past. Though, no, it's mean, great. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great. Pretty tight. It's the right. Yeah, they're doing it the right way. Yeah, yeah I'm yeah. glad to hear that. Yeah. Okay, for sure. Yeah. Okay. But like Terrence said, it's a lot of safety items. It's not. It's not like yeah, you know, the backsplash is out of date, and you're going to upgrade it for these people. It's it's structural. It's health and safety stuff. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, kind of diving the numbers on here, um, and but I know this is this is your your specialty. Like, just how did you underwrite it? What it was like? Walk us through your your fin- your 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 finance model. Okay, so we we had to build a couple phases for this one because there's obviously there's a you know the property is going to operate in its existing form under HUD until February of 2022. So we had to kind of underwrite that, make sure, you know, we obviously, we provide a return. On this deal, it's an 8% preferred return to our investors. So the, as is, essentially, the property needs to perform at a certain metric to make sure that we're not running in the negative yeah. for years one and two. So if I can ask a question here, do, does HUD care if you guys are syndicating this or taking down no. it? Do they, they don't care? Okay. Yeah, I would assume they care, but they don't know. They didn't okay. ask, so we didn't tell them. They just know yeah. that our company's buying it. I'm the operator. Ben yeah. and I are, you know, own the company. We're managing it, and we check the boxes. And yeah. essentially, where the money comes from Who is irrelevant to the them as long as purchase. we're managing it. That's right. Okay. Okay. So we check that box. It's it's operable on its own, and it can clear an eight percent return to the investors between now and the end of the HUD contract. And then we get into the renovation period obviously uh, income is going to decrease during that period execute the renovation with the budget and then release at a at, at higher rents and and be able to cover um, an attractive return you know now we're into IRR or a multiple as is previous to selling anything previous to disposing of the high street condominiums like Terrence talked about in the beginning, basically covering our basis and saying, should we, you know, renovate and we need the the economy is in, you know, X or Y, can we just own this property? That's and that would be both buildings. Correct. Just renovate and rent. Yeah. Like let's yep. say the buyer market for sub 400 properties, 400,000 properties in Denver went away, FHA went away, or let's say something happened to where there wasn't a market for people to buy this kind of asset. Could we still rent it and cash flow? And it makes sense. Right. Okay. Check that box. So we're still on track. And then we tossed around, I think at one point when we were underwriting this, we were calling it, you know, strategy one through five. And we'll do this and hold this. And then, then the adjacent lot to Ogden might be for sale. We would <laughs> buy that and scrape. And basically, so we got down to the three strategies, you know, most likely to um, least likely. And the most, you know, attractive one, the best return we could provide for our investors was to party wall the 11 high street units, sell them individually at a price that I wrote, underwrote at 332500 which I think based As on- As the sales price. Correct. Okay. And based on the comps, I think we'll do a lot better than that. Get yeah, a gar- I would think so. A yard and a garage in that neighborhood. And then refinance Ogden and distribute cash flows for five years. That so that was the emerging business plan that provided the best return. It it looked or it appears to be manageable and practical and something that we're capable of. And plan two, three, and four are also doable and also will 
provide that 8% return at a minimum. And so... And can I ask you, uh, on that strategy one where you're going to, you know, party wall and sell off high Ogden, high Ogden. so for your investors, you're, you kind of got like a, a five-year plan for them before you are done with this deal and distribute all their cash to them? Yeah, so in the memorandum, you know, I kind of explained what we, what I just explained a second ago, but, you know, and really tried to communicate optionality and not say, hey, this is exactly what we're going to do with Ogden. Because Ogden's kind of the the market, you know, follow the market. Because that's, we were talking about neighborhoods earlier. That's pretty, if you don't live in Denver and know Denver sub-neighborhoods, that's downtown. That's, or Rhino. Right. Yeah. You know, that's a core downtown property. Which is like the super trendy area for the Very right. trendy, out-of-state yeah. people. Right. Really cool restaurants, really cool bars, a lot of walkability. Area. Some parks there, yeah. So to tell an investor in 2020, <laughs> hey, this is exactly what we're going to do with this property in five years, I don't think is the best idea. Okay. We know what we're going to do with High Street and the investor is going to get 100% of their principal back through the sale of the condos. And then the company is going to own Ogden either outright or we're going to take a, you know, we're, we'll refinance it and take another mortgage out on that. Um, and that'd be just your company would buy out the investors basically? Well, what we'll no, do is you have to pay down the note. So okay. what the lender wants is, you know, as you sell, they'll attribute a value to every condo. Let's call it 200000 So as we sell each condo, we pay down the bank, and then we use the rest of the capital to do the improvements for the next one. And then, and then you're building up this reserve oh, okay. in the bank account that then you can distribute quarterly. And then so, you, so as you sell each condo, you basically paid down the entire note. You're also paying down Ogden because they didn't separate them. It's one note. And that's just how they wanted it. Gotcha. Okay. So, Right. So, you know, unique things about about this deal, the property manager, to be an approved HUD property manager is a whole nother process. Hmm. So we, de- we decided to inherit the current property manager, which I think is one of only about five in Denver that's HUD approved. Very, uh, really good reputation. And so um, they provide a lot more a few more services to the tenant than you would see from a standard property manager who's basically concerned with, do you need maintenance? Did you pay your rent? Like what, what, what are the you, services? Um, relocation services. The uh, tenant loses their job. They job, help them find another job. Anything yeah. health related. I mean, they're very hands on with the tenants. I mean, they have one person dedicated to those 17 tenants. Really? To help yeah. every, like every, that's their full time? Full time in the office. Yeah. Wow. We had to, Ben and I probably spent three weeks negotiating with them. I mean, it was, they started out, I think we were closer to like 17 or 18% expense of, of property management. Yeah. Yeah. Like gross rents for them? Oh, yeah. Wow. That's what they're used to. Yes, absolutely. They because you have, got a, they have so, they had three full-time people for 17 tenants. Three full-time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we ended up getting it down to something more like in the realm of possibility for us. To be able to, yeah. yeah, it would have killed the deal. Yeah, it would have killed the deal. Yeah, yeah. that is incredibly yeah. high. Yeah. But that's wow. the amount of service that they... Support, have to provide support to they, their tenants. They have, yeah. you know, she was telling me, oh, we have cultural sensitivity training annually, and it's a really, hmm. you know, it's just a more of a, it's a resource to the HUD tenant yeah. for, you know, a, a range of issues. So, you know, that's, um, that's one thing that was, you know, interesting was a lot more expensive if you plan on doing a HUD deal and not becoming a HUD property manager yourself. You, know, you expect to pay a lot more for property management. You probably didn't have 18% underwritten when you first. We did not. Right. That was a possibility. <laughs> right. no. no. And then, you know, we, we put a, a lot more in the expense category of, you know, usually I'll underwrite 5% closing cost on a just a multifamily building or whatnot. But, and that may be appropriate per condominium sold, but the, our team had to look at, you know, we're, we're signing up to do 11 sales on top of everything else we're going to do. So it's the showings and the, you know, the inspections. And so it's a lot of, you know, we budget our whole year about, you know, on bandwidth, how much can we handle, how many doors are under construction at these phases. And so to, you know, signing up to do this project, you know, you have to realize that's a lot of, that's essentially adding 11 doors to your pipeline. Yeah. And selling them all in one year or, you know, 18 months or as soon as possible. So, I had to underwrite a, a bit more um, 
what I called closing costs, but really it's a cost to our team. And this the, is on and the, those, the exit. Yeah, right? and those 11 Correct. will sit vacant, right? Because the way you want to do it, and this is what we, you know, we talked to some other people that when they, you know, when you do a new home housing development and you have 20 homes, you don't put all 20 homes on the market because you kill your leverage and the price. You know, if you, people mm-hmm. know that there's 20. So it's just one at a time. So we do one, you list one at a time, right? You don't want to have so every, 11. Every two months a new one's coming out. Or, right, so there's not, while we're waiting for number one to sell, there's no income on numbers two through 10. Hmm. Or two through, um, yeah, two through 10. Now we can, now we can do construction at the same time, Correct. but you just don't list them. Right. So Correct. it should be once one's under contract, you put the other one. So hopefully, you know, with the Denver market at that price point, you know, I'm thinking it's hopefully every two weeks, two or three weeks, you know, we're putting a new one on the market. Um, but so, yeah, so those are all the things we had to underwrite, which right. made it different, different than a normal, a typical multifamily and this deal. This is the first deal we've done where the a hundred percent of the capital is not called for the previous to the closing. So, you know, what does that mean exactly? So the deal, the, the last podcast we did on that project, you have a closing date, you need money, you know, you get 70%, 60% loan to value from the bank. So you need 40% equity and you need a, you know, a hundred percent of your construction budget. So you tell your investors, you know, hey, this is the project. Are you interested in investing? Yes. All right. This is the closing date. Send, you know, fund the project. Um, you know, the the excess of what we don't get, the equity portion goes to close the property, and then we execute the renovation with, you know, what's left. In this in this project, we only needed about sixty to sixty five percent to close. And then in 2022, we'll need the the remaining 35%. And what gets even more complex is the sale, the sale of condominium one may end up funding the construction on condominium eight, nine, ten, eleven. So, in order to provide the best return, you want to you want to raise the least amount of capital from the investor. Yeah. Right, because the, the way the return's done in, in this world is that the more dollars that are out equity from investors, the lower the return, right? So then you call as few dollars as possible, and then when you need them, you call them, which is something foreign to me that we learned, you know, going through this is, you know, as we were looking at the different models, and it kind of, you know, we were able to realize, hey, if we don't, why would you carry $500,000 in the bank that we're paying 8% pref on? We could just call 400 of that in and when we actually need it for construction. And a step further is we may not even need it if we sell the first one at a healthy profit, the number we think so, that could just fund construction for the next two and we don't have mm-hmm. to call that money, but it's there in case we do need it. So you have to sign, you have to raise the money and get people to sign and commit to it. But at the end of the day, we may not need it, which will juice, which will increase the return dramatically. Right, and so investors. for the investors for this, this deal, if they, you know, they, they're, they're funding the, the takedown, the initial right. closing. Um, so they... The agreement is that hey, if you need to call more money in eighteen months, they will fund. They're the committed to it. That's right. Thirty, yeah. forty percent of it. That's right. Yeah, so it's c- not different investors. It's the same investors. Same so investors, and okay. they're committed to the whole amount. They're just funding it in two different phases. Right. And are you worried about like? I mean, I know, I know you're mm-hmm. you've got gurus with your investors. You're about hey, I don't have that money in two years, or do you call up another investor then bring in money or, or throw some? So your when own? they sign, and Ben could go over the language, but it actually, if they aren't able to do that, they would dramatically be crammed down as far as their return if they fund the first oh, portion of the would, So okay. there's, there, yeah, there's definitely like some consequences to an investor that signs and then can't fulfill their obligation because basically us as the operators, you know, we're counting on them. And when they sign that, the language states that. And I don't remember, you know. Very what, well yeah, it's very well communicated. And then luckily, you know, in, in the environment we're in right now, that would, one investor requesting to not, fulfill the second phase would probably come as good news to, to the other investors because they get an opportunity to basically purchase that equity at the pre-value add price. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's a heavy, di- it it's a like, heavy yeah. discount to the new investor that takes their place or us, the operator, right. if we were to take it, it. And it's a heavy fee to the to price to pay for the investor that is not able right. to fulfill their obligation. So pretty like, low risk to you right. guys for getting yeah. pinched. If, if down the three road. of us bought Apple yeah. at a hundred dollars and it went up to two hundred, and then you told me I don't even want to be in this investment anymore. You can have my shares, and you have to sell them to me 
at 100, but I know today they're at 200. That's an outstanding deal. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. That's well so, said. That, that's, yeah, that's kind of the gist of it. Okay. And so the um, I know this closes soon. I'm assuming it, all the funding is done for this deal, right? The yep. funding's done, yeah. We, I mean, yeah, the same, most of the same people that we've been doing, you know, the same uh, group of investors, you know, when we showed them. And, you know, we drove, I think we drove maybe four or five investors around the neighborhoods showed, and, you know, people that are local to Denver. You know, it's really a no-brainer just based on the neighborhoods and the location. So, yeah, we were able to raise the money rather quickly. The HUD process has taken a lot longer than we thought. We actually got approval in July, but the last signature we need, the lady went on vacation. So we don't have the final. We're approved thing. HUD owners, but the property has to be assigned to the Verico as a, you know, the, the contract has to be assigned to us, which is the last. The HAP contract. The last signature we're and waiting on. And there's one on. person that can there's sign one person. There's only one lady and she's out of, she's been on vacation and she comes back yeah, she's next in week. Dollywood or something like yeah. that. <laughs> Riding roller coasters. <Yeah. laughs> so how much, like, talk to me about the financing side here. Like, how much capital you're raising with investors, and what's the financing look like on this property? Because you said it's one note for the for yeah. the whole portfolio. So just walk us through kind of, like, those numbers if you can. Okay. So we raised, uh, we raised $1.7 in equity, and we raised $1.9 million. Well, we didn't raise, but we acquired debt at $1.9 in debt. And that 1.7, is, is that the total capital or just for That's the total. initial close? Okay. That's total. So, and so you called about what, 1.1? 1. 1, I think to close. One, okay. Right? 1.1? One, one. 61% of 1.7. I can't do that. Yeah, That's one, it's about 1.1. 1, 1. 1, 1, I think. Okay. It's so the total project budget is 3.6. Okay. And so the benefit of not, of calling 61% now and, and, uh, 39% in 2022 is that, that that money, had we called it in one phase, would just sit in a checking account, which we would, you know, the company would have to pay Where you're a making return on. 0.1%, but you're paying out That's right, 8%, a huge return on 8%, that. Exactly. Okay. Right. right. So yeah. the nice thing is, you know, we will have basically between the debt and the 1.1, we're going to have $3 million basically invested between LPs and the bank. And if we sell, so we would basically only have to call maybe the first hundred of that last 35%. And if we are able to turn that first unit and sell it for 340 and you end up selling all 11 for that, we basically called 3.1 million and sold around 3.4 million. So now you have an additional two or $300,000 in equity remaining. Didn't call the last 500 of capital committed. And, you st and then you would own Ogden free and clear, paying the investors. And then we can go over kind of what that return looks like. But that was, that's kind of the high level back of the napkin math of, you know, how we looked at this and why this was such a home, you know, deal that we felt like we had to do. And what about the bank financing on here? Because I think you said before we recorded Very that difficult. <laughs> one, one loan fell through, you said, right? That's right, yeah. First time. Yeah, I mean, first, we had the COVID yeah. stuff. Yeah. And then the loan fell through. So just kind of walk us through that process and then the, the loan, the terms you guys got. Yeah. All right. So using one of our key banking relationships here in Denver, um, like I said, we approached this we approached this bank at probably what will become the worst week in five years <laughs> to inquire. About, about a, financing. Yeah, about a $2 million uh, apartment loan. But- Luckily, you know, the banker that we, you know, our go-to gal over there um, knows us very well. And she's, you know, she's savvy enough to say, hey, this would be better presented maybe in a month. <laughs> I can look at it for you. <laughs> and so, you know, it wasn't an absolute no. We were, I was caught off guard. I thought, you know, the government's going to pay the rent. I don't know. I don't see, you know, the, the DSCR is one and a half. Even if we don't do anything, it was that high with guaranteed government money? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, one point seven six. Um, really? It, yeah. If it's with interest only, if you had, you know, yeah. obviously, if you had principal and interest, it would be probably one two five or one three. So anyway, that kind of she kind of recommended let's push this off a month. You've got you've got two three months to get approved by HUD anyway. Let's let things simmer. 
I'm sure you guys were totally cool with that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. We talked to we, we covered this in the last show, but we talked to some um, agency lenders. One, it's a little bit small. You know, it's under the three million mark. They can do it. They will do it, but it's not. You know, it's not down the fairway kind of. It would take some exceptions and additional letters on top of COVID underwriting, and so the message we got back from them was, we would do this. You're going to have to have to have 12 months of principal yeah. interest insurance taxes in one of our accounts. And that's reserves on top of the HUD reserves, right? Exactly. So that was pretty much out. Um, fast forward, it's coming together. Luckily, the the bank we've been using, you know, they know, they, they have an open book to our economics. And so we don't have, you know, I don't have to send a bunch of um, you know, letters about our background and what we've done and they kind of get it and they, they're able to kind of see, okay, you've executed on deals like this before. It's of your, you know, right size. Terrence has a long track record. And so they agreed to do it um, unofficially. Well, we get to the phase one report and very long story short, um, in the 90s, I guess Colorado Department of Transportation had looked at re, you know, rerouting part of I-70, or like, um, yeah, that's right, yeah, kind of a turnpike to I-70 that would get you downtown, or something like, you know, and it was going to come right through this neighborhood, <clears throat> and so they did an un, you know, an unbelievable amount of soil density testing and minerals testing, and okay, is this a good place to put the so it provided to the EPA a um, hundred x more data than would be present for, uh, you know, any just, other normal just a address, standard single family home. And this become like public record then? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So in the phase one report, it highlighted, oh, glad you asked. We know everything about <laughs> right. this property. <laughs> right. There's nothing we, we happen don't to know. have two hundred pages <laughs> yeah. on just this one There's location. There's nothing we don't know. Yeah. Sounds like good reading. Yeah. And um, so anyway, in the neighborhood, not in the, in this area or this parcel, some plots had come up with higher than usual lead, um, you know, samples in the soil, not on, you know, not on high or Ogden, but within, a, you know, a radius that caused concern. And so the oh, so they look outside of not just That's the right. property, but That's what's right. adjacent to it. Right. Oh, okay. Right. It was like the plot had <clears throat> places on a certain sector of Denver blocks had come up with higher lead levels, and so basically to eliminate the idea that the properties we were on, High and Ogden, had higher lead levels, they requested a phase two, which. Uh, it's very expensive, and it it prolongs the clo- it would have prolonged the closing date. We'd have to go back to the closer and say, "Look, we want to, you know, we're thinking about a thirty to twenty twenty to thirty thousand dollars soil research project." Uh, so you, you, you we got to push back closing, and basically, it could just tell us either it's fine or yeah, there's lead there, or just create well, you know most of the time with these kind of issues from people that we talk to, it just creates more questions. Right. It's not really definitive. It's like a legal opinion from an attorney. It doesn't really give you mm. a definite opinion. It just tells you the risk on both sides, you know? And that's what we were concerned about. And it was just like a no. For us, it was a, you know, kind of a deal killer with that bank. We just said, you know, there's lead everywhere in Denver and you lend on all kinds of properties. You just happen to have a little bit more information on this particular address based on what the DOT was going to do 20, 30 years ago. And yeah, so, which is just bad luck. So, so we had, we ended up having to terminate well, with that yeah. first bank that we've done a ton of deals with. Okay, so you're going to so, talk them into you have to terminate then? Well, I didn't tell them that. I just said, oh, that's interesting. We'll, we'll, I'll circle back here. Okay. So to the credit of the broker, essentially saved the deal. And he said, you know what? This came up with the last buyer I had. And another bank, the, the previous buyer's lender, went through extensive research on this same exact problem. And they got to a place where they were good with it. They had done the environmental underwriting that they needed, and they were, you know, they were ready to fund. 
and why don't we give them a call? And so we called uh, another bank. They said, oh, yeah, we remember High Ogden. We were really disappointed. What happened? We can't believe that never closed. And we said, well, uh, let's do it. It's your lucky day, right? That's exactly right. And so that- And were there terms between bank one and bank two? They they pretty similar? No. Um, there were some, some very small fees that- Just like the, the initial uh, just bank, acquisition fees? Yeah, the initial bank had- you know, had paid for some inspection, research, and whatever and whatnot that w- would have ended up on the closing statement that we'll, we'll, we'll have to settle up on that. But it was really But nothing an, significant? No, not at all. Okay. It was really an easy transition, and the due diligence on Bank 2 was pretty much done from the first buyer. So all they really were interested in was us as buyers. And so, yeah. And so, what what's the down. structure there? Like, what was what's the LTV? What's the IO period? What's the term? All that stuff. It's seventy percent at three point eight. Okay. Seventy percent LTV at a three point eight rate. Three year fixed. What do we get? Yeah, it'll be a three year fixed, twenty five year AM. And we you know we had to negotiate. We had to be forthcoming and say, look, we're gonna we're gonna have eleven transactions, to pay off this to pay off this principal balance so we can't have a any kind of prepayment fee, 11. Mm. Um, no problem there. And so... Yeah. And interest only for the first year, or was it fully... It's 18 months. <clears throat> okay. So right about the time that we start disposing of the um, of the condos, we'll, we'll look at a refund. Okay. Yeah. And so... I know a lot of this underwriting occurred months ago, and this has been sounds like uh, the goalpost has been moved a few times on this this That's transaction. Right, yeah. um, any significant changes from like your original underwriting versus like switching banks? Any like things that came up? Like, oh my gosh, we have to change this or do this. Any anything came up over the last what? I mean, six months of this. No, I would say you know if you're if you're you're growing in multifamily lending and you've got one banker one bank relationship that you know obviously loyalty is good and building rapport and doing transactions you know with the same bank over and over again can really help you and make things more efficient and timely but i would you know i would recommend investing in a, in a couple for re- you know reasons like this you know just to have one you know one shot at financing with one bank that's been Giving you HELOCs for the past five years, or you know, letting you do ninety percent LTV for you know all your real estate investing, I would you know you need to it would behoove you to try to grow that into two or three relationships because this is a you know it's a perfect example. Yeah. Of you know it's no no fault of of Bank One you know they're just doing their due diligence and listening to their environmental folks and you know there's no hard feelings we'll do more deals with them but you know cost the the cost structure you know and the time it just made more sense to transition to this second bank. yep cool all right so I, as we wrap this up like i think it's always i mean it sounds like this was a you know a great deal but also a really good learning experience for you guys so i always i always like the learning experiences right so. yeah so a big recap for you, Terrence, I'm like, hey, being speedy and saying, hey, am I the only one looking at this? And, and what's my, you know, what's my countdown clock? Like what other? Yeah, I think the communication was a really big learning experience for me because just because it hasn't really happened because most of the guys that I'm working with, like I said, I've done, a, I've had a longer track record with and just kind of an unspoken understanding that if they send me something that's off market, they're going to let me like do my full due diligence before they send it to other people. Or if they have other people looking, they're going to tell me. And I think it was just a really good eye-opening experience to realize, hey, not everybody's like that. And I need to clarify that up front when someone sends me a deal that I don't have a big track record with and say, hey, what's my timeline here? And how many other people are looking at this? And can I have 48 hours to look at it? And then let's, you know, and then make a decision from there. And just to clarify that. And then, you know, like Ben talked about, you know, the financing, I, in my mind, this was like a home run deal just because the government's paying the rent. So regardless of a pandemic or anything going on around the world, I thought 
this bank, there's no, you know, I just, in my mind, it was like a foregone conclusion. We were going to get financing. So just that realization that, you know, nothing's a done deal, nothing's a guarantee. And like Ben said, you do have to have multiple banks that you're always talking to, that you have a good relationship with, that you're pre-approved with. Um, so that way when a bank for whatever reason has a different set of guidelines or views something differently that you, you know, you have a fallback option. And, uh, so that was, that was key on this deal. And, uh, yeah, I think just, you know, the persistence that we had on the, on the HUD situation, you know, just made, I don't know how many calls, maybe 25 phone calls just to get to that one attorney that then was able to send a letter. You know, I heard no a bunch of times or heard, Hey, I don't think that's realistic or I don't think there's an attorney that's going to write that letter. I mean, heard so many negative comments about, you know, being able to get something that, that, would satisfy the seller initially that, that hurdle up front. Um, so I just think, you know, the persistence of being able to continue to make calls and not let no, you know, kind of discourage us at the beginning. Um, but yeah, no, I'm really excited about this deal. I think it's going to end up being, you know, great for our investors, great for our company. And, and we're really excited about it. Great. Yeah. I would, I would say the biggest thing I learned was, you know, from the virus, you know, with everything going on, you have to, well, you're going to benefit if you have an investment product that caters to, you know, the the mental place of the investor. When you when you pick up the phone or you're you know you're emailing back and forth, you if you can cater to what's going on in, in that guy's or that girl's um, kind of view of the market, what the next year is going to look like, you're going to be a lot you know, in a better place. If we had, if we had kind of pitched this deal as we're going to do exactly A, B, C, and D, and you're going to make this much money and it's going to be a home run, we would have gotten, we would have, you know, I think we would have received a lot of like, uh, I don't think you guys really know what the next 12 months looks like. I don't, I believe, you know, the virus is going to get way worse, you know, unemployment. And so luckily we were able to find a way in this deal to say, Hey guys, look, this is plan A and this would be great if we could do it. If we can't, this is plan B and this is what your return is going to look like. And if we can't do that, this is plan C. And we know we can do plan C because it's insured by the federal government and it's still a deal. And and the LPs and the investors, you know, I think they took that a lot better and said, oh, okay. So it sounds like you guys have thought about, you know, this virus going any which direction. So you think the the options made a big absolutely, yeah. absolutely, and so yeah, I think um, you know, kind of on the on the fundraising side, thinking about you know putting yourself in the investor's shoes, what's making them nervous? What are they seeing on CNBC every morning? What are they you know what are they seeing in their own stock stock accounts, their own home values, and is this a deal, you know, that is going to be interesting to someone? at this time in uh you know with the election i mean there's just so many variables and so to say to sound overconfident or you know to say oh well you know values are going up six percent a year so the property is going to be worth x <laughs> in 2025 and we're going to sell it for this much i think we would have gotten and we have gotten a lot of like that's great you think that guys but you know you don't see the future so that was the biggest learning point for me i think was um you know, just kind of putting yourself in the investor's shoes and presenting them with options. Okay. This has been great, guys. Like, I mean, I learned, as usual, I learned a ton about the HUD stuff. This was a, a big education for me. So I know from the last podcast, I had a lot of people reach out to me. I meant you guys had more people reach out who wanted copies of the, the offering memorandum you did on here. Is that available? Is that like, what's the, because people want the details. I don't know what the rules are around that. Yeah, it's not publicly, you know, it's not posted on any um, website or anything. If you're interested in investing with us, uh, we'd love to pick up the phone and, or, you know, connect. And I think you've, you'll post a number of ways to do that. And then we can get you these memorandums out um, directly anytime. Okay. We'd love to do it. So yes and no. We'll, yeah. Connect with us, and we'll get you looped in with the with If the people memos. are generally interested in investing, you'll share it with them. Absolutely. If they just want to see a copy of it for the swipe file, that's yeah, probably the, the no, yeah, right? Yeah. Is the... Yeah. Okay. 
that makes sense. Cool. Anything else you guys want to add before we uh, wrap up here? I think we I think we covered it all yeah. really well. I I do think that we are in uncertain times, and we're trying to factor that into every opportunity, you know, and trying to be, uh, you know, although we are optimistic and bullish on multifamily in Denver, you know, we are still trying to take into account all of the other economic factors going in into play right now and and trying to be uh you know accurately you know uh and cautious and conservative and all those things and and uh, really trying to you know our money you know, i think one of the things you know that we've talked to, to everybody that has called is that you know we put in 10 to 20 percent of the equity in every deal sometimes more in this deal we may end up having more um but you know, our money is invested just like everyone else. Our interests are fully aligned and we're trying to protect our own capital just like everyone else's. And we know how hard it is to make money. And we, and we, you know, are really serious about that. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, but at the same time, we're, we're also pretty disciplined and we think that dollar cost averaging in the Denver market over a long period of time is going to, you know, reap a really good reward. And that's, and that's kind of the way we view investing in the real estate market. You know, we can't time the market, but we're disciplined at looking at opportunities and, uh, and we know the market well enough to be able to pull the trigger when we see the right opportunity. Well said, well guys, I appreciate this. And the listeners out there, our plan is to hopefully do one of these about once a month and also do some additional, more like educational content on just underwriting uh, structure syndications. So if you guys have questions, feedback, other things we know, you know, email me. I'll definitely put in our ideas list as we talk about these once a month. But thanks for listening. And guys, thank you for taking some time out of your day. Thanks, yeah, thanks Chris. Thanks for having me. That was great.